Okay, so um, welcome everyone to this seminar in contemporary Marxist theory. We are very happy to host the panel this evening on uh, Queen Slobodian's uh, book, The Globalists. And uh, welcome uh, uh, everyone and thank uh, to Queen Slobodian for being here. I will also introduce the panelists uh, very soon. Um, I think there are two points in uh, Quinn's book that really attracted uh, our, our attention. On the one side is the critique of the um, almost commonplace idea that uh, neoliberalism was about uh, reducing a uh, state uh, to a minimum and uh, re self-regulating markets, while he shows that uh, really the neoliberal project was focused on designing institutions, not to liberate markets, but to encase them and uh, inoculate capitalism against the threat of democracy. And uh, very interestingly, I think he also shows the post-colonial context in which uh, neoliberalism was born, in particular in uh, Austria, after the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and really shows how uh, the original neoliberals struggled with the nationalisms that engulfed uh, Central Europe at the time. And so it's quite interesting then to compare how um, in the wake of decolonization, when countries in the global south raised demands on a new international economic orders, the neoliberals were increasingly influential and were able to lobby international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank to discipline these uh, newly independent countries away from nationalizations, planning and social justice. So this discussion about democracy is really conducted at the global level, including uh, the struggle for independence uh, from, from empire. And so we are very happy to have uh, two uh, intellectual historian, uh, historians here today. Uh, on the one side, uh, Balash Triceni from uh, uh, Central European uh, University. Balash is a professor of intellectual history and uh, he will uh, uh, talk about um, the central European roots of neoliberalism. And on the other side, we have we are very happy to have uh, Virginia Fuentes from uh, the uh, Universidad Federal Fluminense of Niterói in Brazil. Uh, Virginia is a professor uh, there and um, she teaches contemporary history and the methodology of history. And uh, she will then um, explore the Latin American dimension of uh, neoliberalism. And so we hope that uh, this kind of dialogue and also comparison between the kind of uh, Central European and uh, Latin American trajectories will shed new light on uh, Queen's book and uh, neoliberalism, the relationship between neoliberalism and empire more in general. So thank you very much. The idea is that uh, each of the panelists, starting with Queen, talks for about 12, 15 minutes. Um, Virginia will present in French. And we're very glad that uh, George Paisis, uh, a retired uh, professor of French uh, from UCL, but he kind of prefers to forget about his academic past. Uh, he's, here, he's here this evening to and will translate uh, Virginia's uh, speech. And then uh, we'll also uh, facilitate the discussion afterwards with all, with all of you. I see we are already quite a lot of people here. Um, just a few information. We will uh, circulate the links in the chat if you want to uh, receive updates from us, like bi-weekly, monthly updates. Our next seminar is in two weeks with uh, Adam Ketaku on World Making After Empire. We have quite an interesting panel with um, um, two colleagues from King's College, Sara Marzagora and uh, Umeira Iktidar, and Ingrid G Van Graven from the University of York. So we'll circulate some information in, in the chat. And if you want to receive info from us, just uh, subscribe to our um, mailing list. OK, so uh, Quinn, do you want to start? Thank you. Sure. Uh, first of all, big thank you to the organizers for everybody for showing up. 
and um, taking part here. I do have some slides. I thought that rather than simply give a summary of the book, I would just set the scene somewhat, especially within this uh, East Central European context that we've been encouraged to think about for the session today. Um, and I look forward mostly to the free ranging conversation that will follow this. Okay, so in the 1920s, Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek's mentor, pictured there in rare good moon, both seen as fathers of neoliberalism, were both in the 1920s dreaming of a flat earth. Mises was working at the Vienna Chamber of Commerce, a position that he had held since 1909 when he joined as a 28-year-old, just finishing his doctorate. The chamber itself occupied a massive building on Vienna's showcase loop of boulevards known as the Ringstrasse, across the street from an even larger building designed as the War Ministry by the same architect in 1907. The Austrian eagle mounted on the front of the building was so big that an extra floor needed to be built to support it. After the Lost War, the eagle was literally decrowned and it became a police barracks. Next to the ministry in the chamber was the beautifully designed postal savings bank, producing a symbolic trinity here of sound money, security, and enterprise that would define the neoliberalism of future decades. Ludwig von Mises had worked at the war ministry during the First World War. He wrote a single article on the goals of trade policy in which he argued that national borders should be abolished, immigration barriers should be lifted, and that the German empire was better off adopting free trade than quixotically pursuing territory in an already occupied world. After the article appeared, Mises was dispatched back to the battlefront, possibly in retaliation for publishing a position that contradicted virtually the entire policy of the central powers. The article is important though, especially for our purposes, because Mises set up a binary in it that he would use for the rest of his life and that in many ways, his um, Austrian compatriots and the neoliberal movement would adopt as well. He set up this framework of a world organized by the principle of nationality on the one hand, a space that would later be described with the Roman law terms of dominium, and another version of the world organized by the international division of labor, which was indifferent to nationality and then covered the entire inhabited surface of the earth, a space that would become known as the space of, sorry, dominium. Mises' economic imagination was defined by this opposition, the nation versus the whole earth, the space of states versus the space of the single world economy. After 19, 1918, Mises returned to the Chamber of Commerce. The building remained adorned up to this day with the double-headed eagle of the dual monarchy holding the bundled rods of the Roman fasces. Mises may have been thinking of this seal when he wrote admiringly of the Roman symbol of the fasces in 1927, that it did not quote, obscure the truth of the matter, that quote, the state is the apparatus of compulsion and coercion. Contrary to his embrace by Latter-day libertarians, Mises did not mean this in a negative sense. The application of state power, Mises thought was often necessary. In the same book from 1927, he also wrote admiringly about the Italian fascists themselves, who he said had, quote, for the moment, saved European civilization through the repression of communism and had one merit that, quote, will live on eternally in history. This economy that needed to be defended through the application of correct state power was not just national for Mises, but it was global. For the liberal, he wrote, the world does not end at the borders of the state. His political thinking encompasses the whole of mankind. Mises conceded somewhat cheerfully that his understanding of the world coincided in many ways with that of Karl Marx. He felt that Marx was a product of his time, that is the 1860s, when free trade reigned in Western Europe, relatively speaking, and talk of a coming world government seemed actually plausible. After all, Mises pointed out, Liberalism and Marxist socialism were both cosmopolitan. And the bourgeoisie, like the proletariat, was also inherently international. Where Mises saw the two groups differing 
was in the diagnosis of the outcome, where Marx saw increasing immiseration, Mises saw the road to prosperity, rudely interrupted by the tariff wars of the 1870s in response to the First Great Depression and the rupture of the Great War and the return of trade obstacles that followed. Mises shared the global perspective of socialism, in other words, but famously condemned it for lacking a means of allocating resources efficiently. Often neglected is the fact that Mises staged the famous socialist calculation debate, not at the scale of the nation, but at the scale of the world. He claimed that, quote, a hypothetical general director of the world economy was redundant because, quote, what would happen under ideal world socialism by order of the general director of the world economy is already achieved in the ideal of the free world economy under what he called, quote, the reign of competition. In a market system, companies, capital, and workers migrated to better yield and conditions of their own accord. To fail to migrate would be to fail and ultimately to starve, a strong motivator to be sure. So Mises saw the earth as a vast territory of varying natural endowments, which needed to be exploited as thoroughly as possible through the mobility of capital, labor, and commerce. The Habsburg Empire to him, very much idealistically, was a model of a combination of economic integration with some level of national self-determination. Life under what he called the reign of competition left admittedly little room, of course, for individual maneuver. Of the entrepreneur, he wrote, quote, the market controls him more strictly and exactingly than could any government or other organ of society. For workers, it was similar, quote, as a producer, man is merely the agent of the community and as such has to obey. So this famous sort of individualism spoken of by neoliberals is often actually just the correct capacity to adapt to the forces of the market that are directing one in everyday affairs. Amazingly, Mises saw this international division of labor as a process that at least hypothetically might one day be completed. It was, he said, quote, finite. When all men on earth form a unitary division of labor, it will have reached its goal, end quote. The eventual outcome of this process, he thought, writing in the 1920s, would be the emergence of what he called the ecumenical society, which would have necessarily an accompanying world superstate, which he then would believed would realize the failed promise of the League of Nations by divorcing itself from the impracticable principle of national self-determination and taking up its proper limited but intensive role of safeguarding trade, investment, and migration. A strong state would and should be scaled up to the global, which explains his call for a quote, real League of Nations in the 1930s and 40s. What conditions produced Mises' dream of this flat world economy, this, this vision of a global space within which the principle of Shit. economic uh, integration was combined with that of national self-determination. The place he was speaking from after 1918 was post-First World War Austria. Austria, as we surely all know, was hit very hard by the reorganization of territory after the First World War. The loss of its agricultural hinterland, as you can see in the map, and the weight of reparations made it especially dependent on international trade. And this was, as I talk about in my book, one of the reasons why this vision of a small state dependent on world economic integration became a kind of prototype for the condition of smaller post-colonial nations in the era of development in the 1940s, 50s, and afterwards. As Mises thought globally, he actually was playing an active role. He acted locally as the primary advisor of the Chamber of Commerce in a city and country famously governed by social democrats. Mises' policy prescriptions in the 1920s had two sides that were reminiscent of later models of export-oriented growth and development policy. One, open up to the world market, and two, make the internal adjustments necessary to compete internationally. This meant two key measures, push down wages, cut payroll, and cut taxes on industry. In a position statement for the chamber from the 1930s, Mises wrote that, quote, Austria's future depends on free trade. And if their goods were to be able to compete abroad, wages would have to far, 
fall far below their pre-war level. The status of Austria as a commercial island surrounded by tariff walls and governed by social democrats presented a force of obstacles to Mises and his colleagues. On the one hand, there were barriers to trade. On the other hand, the barriers to fall for of wages to fall to their natural level. As the most influential member of a three-person economic commission appointed by the Austrian chancellor in 1930, Mises argued that the terms of trade, the interest rate, and commodity prices themselves were not determined by Austria itself, but were determined by this larger entity of the world market. And thus, the role of governance was figuring out how to respond to the signals of the world market, rather than seeking to organize the internal space of the nation in the best way as one could imagine in response to the citizens desires. The only things that they could change were wages and taxes, meaning both had to be lowered to bring down production costs. The chamber that, Aust that Mises was part of went even further and promoted the passage of what they called, quote, an anti-terror law, anti-terror gazettes, to be used against striking workers, casting organized labor outside of the protection of the law. The newspaper for which Mises wrote these articles called this the, quote, depoliticization of the economic. Needless to say, of course, this form of depoliticization was very political and required a dramatic application of police and executive power. In this case, as with so many in the history of neoliberalism afterwards, the specter of foreign competition, and by extension, the sort of rhetorical image of the world economy became a bludgeon to beat back social policy gains, in this case, of worker insurance, severance pay, and unemployment benefits. In the 1920s then, this world economy that Mises and other liberals imagined, was one where commodities and capital, if not always people, would flow unhindered, unhindered. The world economy was a means of arriving at the greatest possible productivity within the global space. It was a means of recuperating Austrian prosperity after the loss of empire. And as a transcendent point of reference, it justified unflinching opposition to wage and benefit demands of workers as a logic beyond questioning. Most illuminating for understanding the intellectual history of neoliberalism is to see how Mises viewed human organization through the optic of the world. In his vision, nations themselves were fluid and amoeba-like with no necessary relationship to territory or democratic institutions. State power worked within defined parameters as a producer of security, as he put it, an activity which would occasionally require, as you can see in his writings, a suspension of the rule of law. The final reckoning, in other words, People's actions were to be pulled, ruled by the push and pull of demands in the world economy, seeking employment where populations were thin and needs existed, and having no choice but to leave those places when unemployment was no longer available and populations had grown. With the Habsburg gone and the crown removed from the eagle, Mises hoped, in ways that we can talk about in the coming hour and a half here, that the empire of the world economy would somehow have the capacity to better organize and govern human affairs. Yeah, I think I'll leave it with that um, and then just look forward to responses and discussion about the combination of principles of world economy and national self-determination. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I think um, Balash um, comes next, if uh, that's OK with you, Balash. Do you see me? I have some slight problem with the camera, but I hope I'm visible. Do, is it okay? Yes, yes, we can see you. Thank you, Quinn, for your introduction. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. And also thanks to Quinn for writing this book. I think it's a very important book and there are many aspects that can be raised. I think what we will now do is just one of the possible inroads and there could be very, very different stories to be told. And I think it's also part of a broader stream of uh, historicizing uh, neoliberalism and not just taking it as a kind of, um, how to say, a historical or anachronistic uh, label. There are other works, François Denor, Philippe Mirovsky, Dieter Pleve, Niklas Olsen, and some of them are part of the discussion, I think, uh, with, uh, with uh, Quinn. Uh, but many of these works, even these, how to say, more uh, past breaking works were usually completely ignoring the Central European connections. They were very much focusing on the Montpellier uh, 
a society and basically they were uh, looking at you anglo-saxon and german and french context mainly i mean that's that's the usual take on uh, on neoliberalism and they obviously omitted also things outside of uh, the global north yes i mean like there is very very little about that uh, and i think queen's attempt to to include into this context uh, central europe and and also the global context is 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 important not just as a kind of antiquarian or philological uh, research but also has a strong explanatory potential i think the story looks very differently uh, if if you take into account the experiences and contexts of the actors that we are talking about and and i think it's also a possibility to to look at um, global intellectual history with this kind of his central european uh, side perspective uh, it's not the only story to be told from this off center perspective changing a little bit the the big story i mean think about uh, the history of nationalism studies uh, where we usually look at people like hans Kohn, eugen lemberg Karl deutsch edward winter or or ernest gellner as basically western uh, thinkers but we always or very rarely uh, we, we usually forget that that these were all sitting in prague uh, and they were all part of a masarigian debate about political nation in the 1930s i mean and gellner of course comes later but I mean, he's also coming in a way from this discussion but like all the others all this big debate about as eastern and western ethnic versus political nation is actually a czechoslovak debate and it's it's very much about how to construct the czechoslovak nation and it's also exported later on into a global uh, context so i think there is space for kind of rethinking some of these classic uh, global debates from this uh, locational or, or lo uh, kind of off-center perspective. And I, I would uh, say that putting the neoliberal story into this uh, Habsburg post-imperial context is, is very, very uh, interesting. I mean, I, I was personally uh, touched by the way he, uh, he puts together also the Shorskian uh, uh locational uh, approach to to viennese uh intellectual and cultural and even architectural uh frames in which uh, this story can be situated i think we could even sh sharpen or radicalize the some of these claims and also make a couple of parallels with between uh the neoliberal um mindset and their understanding of uh, of globality and other austrian intellectual traditions i'm some of them are somehow uh, lurking at the background of of the book but i mean i, I think it would be interesting to talk uh, shortly about them i mean think about uh, the attempts to depoliticize nationality in uh, from a liberal or not even necessarily liberal perspective in the uh, last hundred years of the habsburg empire i mean starting with people like the liberal fischoff but then reaching their most interesting and most most complex uh intellectual uh versions in the austro-marxist thinking renner and bauer yes and i mean there you have uh exactly uh, i mean not exactly like the neoliberals but there are some very interesting parallels uh, an attempt to keep up big markets uh, to kind of uh, uh facilitate industrial transformation of course the end point should be socialism and not global uh liberal economy but but there is an attempt to somehow take uh, the nations out of this yes and and there is an attempt to deterritorialize and depoliticize them and i would even uh, raise the question to what extent personal autonomy in the uh, in the austro-marxist context could be somehow connected in an interesting way to the idea of consumer sovereignty i mean obviously they are not the same but whether there are some interferences and and if we push this even further maybe we could even go back to josephism and the enlightened absolutist traditions of the 18th century where, which were uh, pursuing welfare uh, of the population with limited participation or with no po political participation whatsoever and uh, actually is arguing for the Rechtsstaat without any sort of uh, actually breaking down all the democratic or, or self-government structures of the ancien regime or pre-ancien regime local uh, uh, noble basically uh, national uh, uh self-governments and and it's basically an attempt to kind of break up uh these structures at, in exchange for creating some sort of uh colorblind uh, welfare of course the 
uh, there is no yet not yet global capitalism it's a very different socio-economic context but uh, there is also a state supported uh, legal order that would somehow regulate this obviously the economic paradigm is mercantilism and not uh, global uh, capitalism at that point. Uh, and then, of course, also the federalist tradition of Austria, li be it liberal or conservative. I mean, some of them are personally con connected to some of the key figures of the story. I mean, Mises uh, were, was uh, advising Kodenhauve uh, Kalergi, as far as I know, and also was connected to, uh, to Otto von Habsburg. So there is a kind of a big discussion in the late 20s, early 30s about uh, how to regain somehow a, a federal a framework, uh, be it the federalization, refederalization of Central Europe, or maybe uh, refederalization or federalization of Europe. I mean, Kodenhove Kalergi, of course, is a key figure for uh, inventing or kind of launching the pan European movement. And I think, in this respect, I think it would be also important to put. Uh, as a hist as a historian, I cannot restrain myself to put Mises and uh, and uh, Hayek and many of other figures, Hyperin and others, into the context of, uh, if you want, personal biographical uh, stories of the losers of the personal losers of the fall of the empire. So it's not only a kind of let's say structural insight or a kind of economic insight, but it's about existential. Uh, experience. I mean, we are talking about, and I think there is quite a lot of research about this from a very different perspective. I mean, kind of uh, social cultural and identity history of the transformation of uh, transnational spaces into nationalized spaces. But think about the fact that uh, the grandfather of Hayek uh, uh, came from, from Arad, from uh, uh, from the borderland between nowadays Hungary and Romania. Uh, uh, Mises came from Lemberg, Lviv, uh, Halperin from Warsaw. I mean, like that's uh, of course a little bit different story, but these are all coming from the edges of the empires, which had an eminently multi-ethnic population. And these kind of places became very, and Schumpeter uh, was teaching in, in Chernovitz, as you probably know, so many of these actors were at these border zones of the empire, which were the real losers of the of the transformation. Yes, I mean, like, and and who are the actors who are actually the real losers? People who don't fit into the new nation states: Germans, Jews, aristocrats, uh, uh, and some of the commercial middle class. And it's not uh, if you want to get a good for those who like literature, uh, uh, look at the novels of Red Zori about this word uh, in the 1920s, 30s. It's a very, very traumatic experience for many people. And I think the, the emotional energy for regaining somehow a supranational framework is not just about a kind of rational reaction to how to solve the kind of economic problems of the tariff wars. It's an absolutely existential issue. And I think I would like to also stress this existential element in the other uh, aspect of, uh, I mean, if you want the Geneva story, which uh, which goes a little bit beyond the Central European uh, frame, but but also uh, connects to it. I mean, there is, I think, uh, something that, that is a little bit underplayed in, in Quinn's uh, work, uh, and I think in most of the other works about uh, neoliberalism, but I think it's important to mention that I think we, we should also face uh, the fact that although it's true that Mises in 27 pr praises Mussolini and there are arguments that in a way he kind of invents the later Noltian uh, re uh, reaction paradigm of, uh, of fascism as a reaction to Bolshevism, but many of the other actors, uh, Mantu, Ferrero, and all the others who are in the Genève um, Institut Universitaire des Autetudes uh, Inter International, where uh, our figures are also located uh, or connected, were actually anti fascists and they were also very, very deeply. Uh, I mean, most of them were actually exiles, or many of them were exiles from from different uh, authoritarian regimes, and they had a very, very strong experience of, of the collapse of two things uh, at the same time. One is, uh, is uh, basically the uh, traditional representative democracy in many of the countries, uh, and the other one is, is uh, the failure of the League of Nations, which they were structurally connected to. Yes, I mean, like, let's face it, uh, the League of Nations and many of the actors like Rappar, 
uh, Mantu and the others are writing about this. So like there is also this part of the origins of neoliberalism. It's about international institutions, yes, and how international institutions can handle uh, national conflicts. And what they were actually looking at all the time is that basically national sovereignty trumped, even though the League of Nations started with a kind of uh, how to say utopia of uh, enlightened self-interest of the nations to cooperate. Basically, there was no uh, organizing principle which forced the nations to comply. And then basically in the end, the, the League of Nations was unable, first of all, to uh, enforce any kind of, as you probably know, minority protection. Uh, uh, so basically nat nations said that, sorry, but we have national sovereignty and also we have, by the way, uh, national uh, um, self-determination and national self-determination uh, is only applicable to nations but not to minorities so basically there was a kind of collapse moral collapse and also structural collapse and in the end basically uh, political collapse of the league of nations so there were two basic uh, starting points of the post-war order which seemed to be in the early 20s to be the kind of formative framework for what will become the post-war order and which uh, collapsed by the late 20s, early 30s, and all our actors are moving in this very, very existential experience of, of the collapse of everything that seemed to be more or less the kind of basic starting point. And, and it's not by chance then that they are trying to look for something like a kind of, if, if not an invisible hand, but some sort of principle that would organize the globally the world and force actors to comply with something that they could and and it's of course also in the context i mean like we have other ideas coming from the same uh, um, transnational elites i mean think about international law uh, which is also coming from uh, Lviv Lemberg yes i mean like all, and also uh, theory of genocide and all all that so i mean it's not by chance that many of the people coming from these regions were actually so much fascinated by finding out some sort of supranational principles that would somehow trump the nation state yes and uh, then the two more things very quickly i mean one is uh, i think it's important to bear in mind that that although uh, this story is about this central european uh, uh, figures mainly but if we look at the broader neoliberal kind of actors, then I think we get a mind boggling plurality of political positions. I mean, like, just think about, for example, I think it's very well studied now, like the French figures, some of them, uh, I mean, they're shifting at least four times between 29 and uh, 45, not to speak about what happens to them after 45. So it's very, very hard. And I think it's very important in this book that there's no attempt to kind of give an executive summary of what a neoliberal is about, because it's an extremely situational uh, a story. I mean, if you look at these French figures, I mean, they shift from pro, uh, from popular to, uh, to critics of from popular. Some of them will cooperate with Vichy, some of them will cooperate with De Gaulle, some of them will uh, emigrate, some of them will not, some of them will come back and some of them will not. So I mean, like, it's an extremely complex picture of, oh, and, and it's very often unpredictable. So the same person who, who was serving the from popular government could have actually joined Vichy. So it's not at all that, you know, there is left and right. Right. I mean, there are even more complex. Uh, some of them actually opt for fusing neoliberalism with corporativism. Some of them are against corporativism and so on and so on. And uh, I think it's also uh, very important that, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's probably the context where East Central Europe comes into the picture that how uh, this story of neoliberalism uh, squares or doesn't square with the story of liberalism. Yes, I mean, are we talking, I and mean, when we talk about these neoliberals, are we talking about, uh, how to say, the continuation of liberalism with other means, to uh, paraphrase um, um, uh, Clausewitz, or, or we are talking about something completely different? And here, of course, all the morphological and ideological studies of uh, 20th century liberalism, mainly Michael Frieden and others would come into play. And it would be very interesting to look at how different types of liberalism are related to each other. I'm telling this because of course, at some point, these neoliberals seem to be exactly, and I think this is also Quinn's argument, seem to be extremely critical of 19th century liberalism. Yes, I mean, like that's their whole point. This is how they situate themselves. Now, uh, can this debate be contextualized or recontextualized also as a debate of uh, the East Central European laboratory of parallel liberalisms that are actually fragmenting 
already in the 1910s or 1920s. Uh, a Frieden's argument is that, let's say in uh, Western Europe, it seems to be that, uh, let's say up to 1918, there is a relatively coherent common liberal platform and then liberalism breaks into cultural liberalism, political liberalism and economic liberalism, and they don't talk to each other anymore. And I would argue that in East Central Europe, probably this fragmentation happens earlier. Maybe it's already there at the turn of the century, like liberal nationalists or national liberals and the civic radicals, for example, in Central Europe don't talk to each other anymore. I mean, they have a very different understanding of the economy and politics. So, so this is one thing. And then the last thing I would like to very quickly mention is how populism and neoliberalism relate to each other. I think there is a very ominous uh, last uh, sentence or last paragraph in the book about the Brexit. And I think we should think about uh, that, I think also in uh, to what extent the contestation of neoliberalism and, uh, uh, and the populist democracy and populism is kind of on the same side. Are we, are we talking about a clash between democracy and and uh, neoliberalism, and if yes, then where populism stands. I mean, there seems to be probably a, a possible reading of the book that some sort of populism is a kind of not friendly, but democratic reaction or not very nice, but democratic reaction to the kind of neoliberal hegemony. I would maybe raise the question also looking at the Central European intellectual traditions that whether this relationship of populism and neoliberalism is not more complicated. I mean, I would argue that, for example, Röpke, uh, who is not East Central European, but had a very strong East Central European reception already in the 30s, is actually a very strange combination of populism and neoliberalism. And it's not by chance that the third way, uh, our idea before the 1970s, 80s, third way discussions was received in the 1930s as third way ideology by the East Central European populists. Yes, I mean, like Röpke is actually a reference point of many uh, intellectual populists who are not necessarily, by the way, anti-liberal, even in East Central Europe. I mean, Istvan Bibo, one of the most interesting Hungarian thinkers, is, is actually a, some sort of liberal populist. Uh, so he, he was actually a student of the Genève school and he was student of Ferrero. So I, I will I will st stop here and, and maybe just ra raise the last uh, nasty question to what extent uh, uh, basically, uh, neoliberalism and, and the Geschloss and Handelstadt goes together. Yes, yeah? so I mean, like we tend to think about neoliberalism as the book also shows uh, as uh, as a kind of opening up, uh, for better or for worse, about globalization. But what about neoliberalism going together with closing? Uh, and I think coming from Hungary, I, I think I can't not mention uh, our own uh, political context where I think there is a very strange combination of neoliberal policies and ethno-populist policies. And in this respect, again, as uh, Central European reference, isn't there another story of neoliberalism? Actually, it's probably not only a homonymy, an accidental homonymy, that the first neoliberals in uh, East Central Europe are not uh, Hayek and not von Mises, but people whom Quinn also knows uh, quite well, the Romanians of the 1920s, Manoilescu uh, and Zelatin, who end up being, uh, I mean, at least Manoilescu ends up the most important corporativist and fascist intellectuals of Europe and a, a debate partner of Hayek in the 1930s. Yes, so I mean, like the neoliberalism as a notion actually is launched by them in the 1920s. And I think maybe then then this connection between neoliberalism and fascism is even more complicated than Mises gestures about, you know, the kind of needing Mussolini to clear the, uh, the, the, the air, but also there might be an even more complicated relationship between these ideologies. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Palesh, for this uh, really insightful comments. I think uh, you really showed how how important it is to look at neoliberalism from the Central European context. We now move to uh, the Latin American context. So our next speaker, Virginia Fuentes, and um, um, well, George Paises will translate her. Alex, you raised your hand. Do you have uh, anything to say? Okay. I was trying to clap. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Comment nous ferons? Je parle deux, trois phrases et vous traduisez comment on s'organise. Bon, d'abord, merci. Euh, 
pour l'invitation. Et je suis très, très contente d'être là. Et je regrette, mais je ne peux pas parler de l'ensemble de l'Amérique latine, mais je vais parler à partir de mes propres recherches sur, euh, et je vais expliquer. Le travail de King est très impressionnant, l'ampleur temporale, le volume de sources, l'approche, et je vais mettre en évidence deux éléments sans trop du livre. George, you need to unmute. Unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Virginia is thanking uh, the, um, the, for the invitation, and she's going to speak about her own um, research. And uh, she says as an opening statement that the work is very impressive, um, but for its um, breadth, both in terms of the time scales that it covers, and also the number of sources and the depth of which it treats those sources. Le premier, l'importance de l'État pour la pensée euh, néolibérale, du droit des constitutions, du fédéralisme, hein, et, et cette question euh, que votre livre euh, amène hein, de façon très claire de cette théologie juridique de la séparation entre euh, imperium, euh, imperium et dominium, dominium qui va constituer une base simple et très opérationnelle pour la mise en œuvre des contrôles internationaux sur le choix politique démocratique national. Um, first of all, she thinks um, it's really interesting that when you talk when you talk about the role of the state and the in this connection the separation between imperium and dominium which um, is translated into a um, method of international control um, of uh, the flow of capital. Yeah, ça va? Ça va, bon, euh, je ne peux pas faire le contrôle de la traduction hein, parce que je ne contrôle pas l'anglais, alors <rire> c'est parfait. Donc, ma position a euh, une particularité car euh, depuis des années, j'ai critique euh, la surutilisation du label néolibéralisme auto-attribué par, par ces intellectuels qui sont financés par des entreprises ou des entrepreneurs dans des associations à but non lucratif car je crois que ce label généralisé euh, peut omettre, peut cacher les caractéristiques historiques et concrètes de transformation actuelle du capitalisme. Um, she'd like to criticize the uh, use of the label neoliberal too broadly because it is it to cover this group of finance um, of um, intellectuals who are financed by um, various uh, private sources and is actually um, a process which is, um, hides the development of capitalism as it's going on at the present. Je vais sauter des morceaux du texte pour aller plus vite. Mon hypothèse de travail euh, repose sur l'idée que la politique capitaliste contemporaine ne se limite pas aux institutions, qu'il s'agisse de partis nationaux ou même des institutions internationales, dont l'activité reste fondamentale, mais est complétée par des entités associatives, une bonne partie financée par des entreprises et des entrepreneurs, et qui compte souvent avec le soutien des de gouvernements, des États, voire des organismes internationaux. Ces sociétés constituent la société civile et sont terrain de lutte des classes, comme l'a montré Gramsci. Her hypothesis is that um, this capitalist policy, 
which is um, not only institutional um, and not only national or international, um, is actually made up of a sort of um, civil society of uh, intellectuals who are trying to develop and expand uh, the rule of capitalism. And the Gramscian, the, using the notion of civil society in the Gramscian sense. C'est donc à partir des luttes de classe, euh, des, luttes, des luttes plus concrètes dans des terrains divers, que j'essaye de comprendre euh, la politique et les formes de domination du capitalisme contemporain. Et donc, je, je souligne juste les appareils privés d'hégémonie, ça c'est la catégorie euh, élaborée par Gramsci pour l'ensemble de lutte, mais je vais juste souligner euh, les appareils privés d'hégémonie soutenus par des entrepreneurs. Donc, des appareils d'hégémonie, euh, je vais dire APHE, qui sont soutenus par des entreprises ou des entrepreneurs. Um, this is a class struggle, um, and central to, which is central to understand uh, the development of contemporary capitalism, and um, how it expresses the hegemony, uh, in the, again, the Gramscian sense, of um, capitalism to try to expand and dominate the debate and the course of its own development um, in opposition to struggles of the uh, resistance of the working class. Je souligne que le concept de Gramsci prend tous les spectres de lutte et que je vais concentrer juste sur ce voué à la domination. Yeah, um, she repeats that Gramsci's concept of hegemony um, totally encapsulates uh, this attempt of domination by the ruling, by the uh, capitalist ruling class. Les néolibéraux ordo-globalistes, tels que vous nous présentez de l'école de Genève, sont un groupe de formulations dans un immense univers d'autres appareils d'hégémonie financés par des entrepreneurs. Euh, et comme la plupart de ces congénères, ils construisent une approche du monde vue d'en haut, mais ont une activité assez précise par les bas, euh, du micro au macro, pour assurer de plusieurs formes, la garantie de la sacro-sainte propriété du capital et assurer les droits des investisseurs. Um, the neoliberal um, intellectuals and their capitalists doing everything that they can in order to um, guarantee the sanctity of capital and its expansion throughout the world, both in both um, in the macro sense and in the micro sense, uh, wherever they can. Uh, ces appareils privés d'hégémonie uh, qui sont ancrés à la fois dans l'espace national et dans des espaces internationaux ne se limitent pas aux questions économiques. Euh, ni comme d'ailleurs euh, l'école de Genève, mais touche de plus en plus de nombreux aspects de l'ensemble de la vie sociale, car ils investissent exactement là où poussent, émergent, surgissent les luttes populaires, les luttes sociales, et agissent, ils agissent pour empêcher ou réduire leur portée nationale et internationale. Um, this apparatus of hegemony um, no, doesn't affect only the economy, but also various aspects of social life and aims to stifle and control any attempts at resistance by people um, at the bottom to, against the effects of this uh, process. Euh, 
dans les années 80, euh, un auteur uruguayen euh, qui a vécu au Brésil a écrit un très intéressant livre, une recherche assez poussée, qui s'appelle « L'international capitaliste », où il fait euh, un, une sorte de généalogie qui n'est pas celle de l'école de Chicago, mais qui est de l'organisation des appareils privés, des gémonies, c'est-à-dire des associations sans but lucratif, euh, qui euh, organisent plus, de plusieurs manières des entrepreneurs et des entreprises. Et euh, je recommande, je pense qu'il n'a pas été traduit euh, en anglais, mais c'est un travail absolument formidable. Et il commence cette généalogie en 1911, avant la Première Guerre mondiale. Um, in the 1980s, Uruguayan author wrote um, a very interesting book called The Capitalist International, uh, which describes the hegemonic apparatus of um, not only enterprises, but also those who run the enterprises in order to expand uh, their activities in all sorts of areas of um, social life. Ces associations à but non lucratif, des entrepreneurs, des entreprises ou un mélange est très particulier, se proclament non partisanes, mais elles ne se proclament pas non politiques. Toutes formulent ce qu'elles appellent des politiques publiques euh, et se proposent à aider à leur mise en œuvre. Évidemment que nous avons là ce qu'on a en apparence, ce sont des entités philanthropiques qu'aujourd'hui s'autodésignent comme un investissement social, mais plusieurs autres, dont l'École de Genève, la Société Montpellierin et une quantité d'autres entités qui apparaissent dans votre travail. Um, these organizations often call themselves non-partisan, but actually are very political. Um, for example, some NGOs which claim to be um, charitable organizations, but actually are carrying out very political sort of work. Um, uh, oui. <laughs> C'est ça, je pense. <laughs> Et il, faut, il faut se rappeler que, par exemple, la Fondation Carnegie et la Fondation Rockefeller sont au départ de ces groupes euh, de l'Europe centrale, dans les financements de ces groupes. Et euh, on peut aussi rappeler que dans les années 40-50, la Fondation Rockefeller avec la Fondation Ford est à l'origine de ce qu'on appelle la révolution verte. Donc, on, on, je je n'ai pas le temps de, de détailler ça. Ce qu'il faut dire, c'est qu'il y a un maillage, un réseau d'étoiles de APHE euh, pour contrer des luttes moléculaires, moléculaires des secteurs populaires. Et ces secteurs populaires sont durement combattus dans toutes les organisations euh, qui sont dirigées vers le travail, le travail des travailleurs. Euh, et c'est cet ensemble de APH et c'est cet élargi sans cesse après la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Il y a eu un nouveau bond quantitatif dans les années 90. Um, these NGOs, for example, uh, if we go back to the 1940s um, of Rockefeller and Ford, um, uh, Virginia calls them uh, APHE, um, apparat private apparatuses of hegemony. Um, And these have been working since then in order to further the project of uh, international capitalism. 
and they work as a kind of a network, um, as a yes, as a network which um, complement each other. Ces réseaux, et j'insiste, parce que là, je travaille uniquement par, avec ces entités qui sont financées par des entrepreneurs, des entités sans but lucratif, euh, financées par des entreprises ou des entrepreneurs. Euh, ces groupes, c'est une formation euh, très diversifiée euh, qui cherche à influencer voire à diriger des luttes contre la pauvreté, contre les racismes, pour la défense des femmes, pour la défense de l'éducation, que ce soit public ou privé, de la jeunesse, de l'environnement et d'autres, et d'autres, et d'autres. C'est-à-dire qu'on peut lire les luttes des classes à l'envers. Quand on voit l'activité de ces entités, de bourgeoises, des entrepreneurs qui sont sans but lucratif, on voit la lutte des classes presque comme son revers. Um, if you look at the activities of these groups, you actually see the class struggle, but backwards, because they do, um, they act in such a way that they, 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 um, claim to deal with poverty, with women, with um, all sorts of social issues that are important, but actually from the point of view of the interests of capitalism. Non, je, je fais... Pardon? Oui, c'est bon ce que j'ai dit. Ah ben, je comprends pas. <laughs> c'est une situation complexe, effectivement. Donc, euh, D'abord, un compliment à, à l'auteur, Slobodja, car il n'a pas glissé dans la trappe qui est l'utilisation du terme ONG. Que c'est une vraie trappe constituée euh, juste après euh, 44 euh, et qui conduit certains auteurs soit à tout simplement ne pas voir les luttes de ce côté-là, surtout cette sorte de néo-institutionnalisme qui se met en route et qui met devant tous les institutions, ou devant même les relations effectives, soit au contraire d'autres auteurs à enfler leur portée et à constituer des théories du complot euh, et non pas à miser sur soit la forme concrète de lutte, soit la portée et la proposition qui sont mises en œuvre. Et de ces, de ces points de vue-là, c'est l'un de mérites très important euh, du livre, l'un d'entre eux, justement, de montrer, comme c'est permettre de comprendre que ces luttes, s'élargissent et donc l'activité capitaliste s'accroisse dans l'impossible tentative de concilier l'Empire, des contrôles antidémocratiques dans les espaces nationaux et l'expansion internationale et du domaine ou de la liberté de mouvement de capital. Um, she would like to compliment the author for not falling into the trap of um, the NGOs um, and to see through these uh, institutions and the work that they're doing um, in the areas that um, they claim to be uh, helping people while in fact they're actually furthering the cause of the expansion of capitalism into all sorts of areas which go right into the um, nitty-gritty of social life and uh, human uh, existence. Il me semble que nous avons un défi formidable parmi les marxistes euh, face aux, 
à ce que j'appelle le soi-disant néolibéralisme, que c'est de comprendre pourquoi juste ce groupe, l'un d'entre autres, va être mis au devant de la scène, alors qu'il y a une telle quantité d'autres groupes qui agissent en parallèle et dans une bonne partie en syntonie avec eux. And a challenge for Marxists is to try to understand why um, these groups, these NGOs, have been taking the um, initiative and have been uh, put, in, put at the forefront of these kind of um, struggles that take place when, in fact, um, others should be uh, taking the struggle instead of them. Et donc, j'arrive justement à la conclusion du livre euh, sur euh, la, la question de l'opposition. Ce n'est pas la conclusion, c'est-à-dire cela traverse les livres. L'opposition de l'ordoglobalisme au nationalisme populaire qui va être <coughs> comparé au populisme. Et j'ai des doutes si on peut effectivement tracer cette ligne de contreposition, car il me semble qu'il y a une sorte d'accord tacite entre ces groupes qui permet d'accepter leur désaccord théorique interne pourvu que la question centrale soit conservée, c'est-à-dire mouvement du capital garantie des investissements. Um, she says that in the conclusion of the book, what she believes comes out in, well, what she believes is that although there are differences within these various groups um, and between uh, globalism and nationalism, there is an underlying, there is an underlying um, uh, agreement between them to guarantee the sanctification of capital and the movement of it and the defense of their investments internationally. Toujours là maintenant sur la fin du livre, quand réapparaît la question du Brexit, je m'interroge si l'on n'est pas devant, et je m'interroge sur cela avec plusieurs autres auteurs latino-américains, sur les formes de polarisation toxique ou bien une sorte de falsification de la polarisation. Um, and she, tu peux répéter, s'il te plaît, la, la fin? Uh, si on n'est pas devant une polarisation toxique ou une falsification de la polarisation sociale. Une falsification? De la polarisation. Uh, whether it's um, the question of Brexit, whether it's a toxic polarization that's taking place or a falsification of social polarization that uh, led to it, i.e. that people voted uh, because they were pissed off. Uh, évidemment, c'est-à-dire qu'on est à nouveau devant une contreposition qui tout simplement élimine les conflits des classes en tant que tel, et met en avant le, le deux, disons, le deux partis politiques du capital qui sont un peu à l'image des partis politiques nord-américains. And whether this actually is hiding, this is hidden, the fact behind the fact that there are the two political parties uh, which are similar to the political parties in Latin America, Um, which are either for or against uh, Brexit, but actually is hiding something below it, uh, hiding, hiding something behind it. Je conclue sur le cas du Brésil et un peu sur Trump et aux États-Unis, où euh, cette extrême droite euh, qui défend de, de valeurs morale euh, 
chrétienne extrêmement réactionnaire. Vas-y, Georges, je vais, je, vais euh, je vais être plus doucement. Um, and she'd like to conclude with the question of Brazil and Trump, where the extreme right, um, which defends uh, a moral and Christian and reactionary doctrine, qui sont soutenus et qui soutiennent des églises néo-pentecostales et partie importante de l'église catholique, and which are supported by um, Uh, Protestant and Pentecostal churches, but also by the Catholic Church. Qui, qui combattent sur la science, qui sont contre la science, qui, qui soutiennent que le, la Terre est plane. Yeah, which are also anti-science as well, and even um, almost as if they're talking about a flat Earth society. Qui se présentent comme nationalistes, which present themselves as nationalistic, mais qui sont totalement alignés sur les terrains internationaux. But are totally um, in accord at, at the international level between themselves. Apparemment, le seul point national, c'est l'opposition à la Chine. And the only common uh, international point that they're interested in is competition And opposition to China. Donc je conclue. Est-ce que nous sommes devant un retour au point d'origine des années 14 euh, et d'une certaine manière à la fin de la Première Guerre mondiale avec les fascismes comme condition pour imposer la permanence de ce que Liu Panitch a appelé l'Empire informel um, Est-ce que la, par, la lutte apparente entre elles ne cache-t-elle pas euh, un accord fondamental? And she's wondering whether we're not going back to the 1914s um, when um, there was. Tu peux répéter s'il te plaît ce que tu as dit à la fin après les années 14? Euh, après les années 14 et. et un donc, retour à quoi? Le fascisme, l'émergence postérieure du fascisme, euh, qui est le point de départ euh, du travail de ces ordo-globalistes, est-ce euh, que cela ne signale dans l'actualité un retour à ces points d'origine, le fascisme, comme condition pour imposer la continuité de l'empire informel tel que l'a formulé Liu Penich. Ok. Ok. Um, and she is wondering whether we're not going back to the period of the 1940s when you have the uh, beginnings of the emergence of fascism and as a point of departure for the order globalists, which was the point of departure of the order globalists. Um, as a condition for the informal empire um, that uh, Leo Panic was uh, beginning to pose. Et juste une petite question finale. C'est un détail, mais c'est un détail de curiosité. That's the last question. Um, which uh, she's curious about, but it's a small detail, but she's curious. Les études récentes sur l'extrême droite euh, au Brésil ont montré euh, qu'une partie était hébergée en Suisse après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale et était hébergée exactement de façon semblable et dans des entités à but non lucratif qui se présentaient comme des écoles ou des centres d'études et des formations. Et ces entités ont eu un rôle très important au Brésil 
dans euh, l'appareil d'État et dans l'organisation d'autres appareils privés d'hégémonie tenus par les entrepreneurs d'extrême droite. Et donc la question est, est-ce que vous avez trouvé des choses à ce sujet um, She's asking whether um, there's a, something that's curious for her, is that the recent studies on the extreme right in Brazil, um, that after the Second World War, Uh, various people were protected in organizations which were charitable or NGO type of organizations financed by right-wing um, entrepreneurs. And uh, these played a very important role in defending and uh, allowing this um, group of people to continue. And uh, whether you've come across anything like that um, in your studies. Thank you. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Virginia. Thank you very much, George. Uh, Pour les sacrifices. <laughs> yes, immolation. <laughs> no, that was really, that was really good. And uh, I think you posed a lot of uh, very important questions. So what I suggest is that um, we let Queen, maybe do you want to get back to, or maybe respond to some of the questions or would you like to collect more questions from the audience first? I think I should probably just have a quick stab at both of those comments very quickly before we collect. Yeah, I agree. That's the best way. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, so thanks very much. Incredible amount of uh, material here to think about. I guess the first thing to say is maybe the obvious thing, which is that, that what I'm proposing in this book is not a kind of grand unified theory of global neoliberalism, full stop. I mean, it's not the only story that one can tell. And in fact, if we only had this one, we would be in trouble because we'd be unable to understand a lot of the things that have happened in the world and continue to happen in the world. So the angle that I chose, um, starting in East Central Europe, starting in some ways with the problematic of the world rather than the problematic of the nation, was designed in some ways to counteract tendencies that were, I think, dominating the historiography of neoliberalism at the moment, which had been very much Anglo-American focused, and had very much work on a kind of diffusion model that began with a national scale, national experiments in neoliberalism in Chile, UK, America, that are then globalized through the interna international financial institutions in the 1980s and 90s in the form of structural adjustment. And so the global space only comes on to the neoliberal agenda in this intellectual history sometime in the 1980s and 90s, which is obviously incorrect and, and sort of turns the matter on its head, I think, because as I argued in this small vignette here and elsewhere in my book at more length, the problem of the world economy was really central to the people who became the leaders of the neoliberal movement from the nearly the beginning of the 20th century onward. And it was central because the 20th century brought a distinctive problem, which was the problem of the generalization of the principle of one person, one vote democracy. So the, the classical liberals in the 19th century, this gets to a bit of what you're talking about, Balash. They didn't have to worry about that because there were, there were ways to justify the disenfranchisement of half the population in the form of women, large parts of the population through property bars, large parts of the world population through the, um, the reality of colonialism. By the 20th century, by the end of the First World War, and then by the end of the Second World War, You have these two principles, one, one person, one vote democracy, two, the principle of national self-determination, which become generalized and become kind of baseline demands in a way that neoliberals are then um, challenged with uh, coming up with structures that can respond to and integrate these principles uh, without completely um, transgressing them. So I think This, I think, is the most productive way for me anyway to think about the, the neoliberal problematic in the, in the 20th century is how can capitalism be protected from democracy without doing away with democracy altogether? And the, the history I tell in the book is a series of institutional fixes that are observed by neoliberals, in some case actively proposed by them, that can sort of constrain, direct, um, safeguard 
constraining direct democracy in ways that capitalism remains protected and safeguarded. And these are a series of more or less failed projects, right? They think that the League of Nations might be able to do this. It ends up failing in, in those terms. The UN ends up placing the principle of nationality over the principle of world economic interdependence in the end. Even the international investment law apparatus of things like bilateral investment treaties have even in recent decades fallen into um, unpopularity with receiving countries and things like uh, investor state dispute settlement, third party arbitration courts that sit outside of nations and allow corporations to sue nations. Even these things are now falling into disrepute. The new NAFTA treaty, for example, has removed ISDS from its structure. These things are under um, huge pressure from both left and right. So that's another way of sort of reintroducing the, I think the particularity of the material I wanna cover in the book. It's not an attempt to render irrelevant the kind of very important networks that Virginia is describing for us, which I, I take the work of people like Hank Overbeek, who's on this call, and others who work within the you know, Gramscian tradition of international political economy, who have you know, provided us with essential insights about the interlocking interests of the transnational capitalist class and the way that then gets um, carried out by wings of the NGO apparatus, wings of the IFI apparatus. I mean, these are all things that we need to know about to understand neoliberalism as an actual existing reality in the world. What I found interesting in my book was to focus in though on these moments where the uh, institutions of business advocacy, so for example, the International Chamber of Commerce, was attempting to make use of the policy expertise of certain neoliberal intellectuals. But sometimes those demands of neoliberal intellectuals or their imagination actually exceeded that of the policy, the policy advocacy groups themselves. So in a couple of moments, for example, in the book, um, you have someone like Michael Halpern, who's helping to write the first international investment code, which then basically becomes the BIT treaties that now exist everywhere. And he wants the rights of, he wants the rights of nations to be so constrained that they can be trumped, in fact, by the kind of prerogative of capital. And even the business people involved in something like the International Chamber of Commerce don't want to go that far. So they didn't want to sign on to, for example, a version of the International Trade Organization right after the war that would really constrain the room of maneuver of national capitalists that went too far for them. So there's a way in which these neoliberal intellectuals are useful to look at because they're in a way even more radical than the most radical capitalists. I think they are true sort of um, extremists of a vision of global economic interdependence. So in other words, yes, to the neo-Gramscian insights about transnational capitalist classes and the way they lock into various extended forms of civil social pressure, um, but also look for moments of disjuncture and friction where the neoliberal imagination isn't always line up perfectly with the political economic reality. Another example of this is intellectual property rights, which are often seen as a uh, an instantiation of neoliberalism in the world. And yet neoliberals themselves had often a much more dovish and soft approach to international intellectual property rights than we actually see enshrined in things like the TRIPS arrangement and other forms of copyright law. So I think it's useful to look for moments of disjuncture between the political imagination of neoliberals themselves and then the actual existing institutions of neoliberal political economy that end up coming to be. Um, I, of course, can only give slight justice to these wide ranging comments that have been offered, but I wanted to say to, to Balash's point, yes, I appreciate this sort of um, further exploration into what you describe at some point as the kind of Habsburg laboratory, right? I mean, certainly Mises and Hayek were not the only people who saw either at the time or in retrospect, the Habsburg empire as a kind of world society in miniature, right? Um, this is the perspective that someone like Hans Kelsen uses, Herr Schlauterbacht, um, Karl Popper, of course. They were very interested in the way they believed that a kind of unity and diversity had been achieved within the imperial space. 
that could perhaps be scaled up to the international and global space. And in some ways, the way that the work of people like Natasha Wheatley has shown, we can see the kind of legal categories that are used within Habsburg law to give certain rights to different nationalities as the seed of the kind of claims to um, natality and, and, and nationality that come to exist at the global level after 1945. So I think this is something that I found anyway an important um, entry point to the problem of neoliberal governmentality was to see that these figures, Mises in particular, but Hayek too, were in a way trained to be civil servants of an empire which suddenly ceased to exist, right? Mises and Hayek did not receive degrees in economics because there were no degrees in economics. They received degrees in Staatswissenschaften, the state sciences. They were trained to govern, not to um, adjudicate uh, economic problems of reasoning or create statistics. So in that sense, I think it's worthwhile to go back to people like them in a moment like right now, where I think there's a real vacuum of political economic rationality, right? I mean, if you read the pages of the Financial Times, read the pages of the Wall Street Journal, there is actually a real um, absence of consensus around what the principles should be that will govern global economy right now. In that sense, I think we're repeating a kind of similar moment to the post First World War moment, where the old sort of um, the old certainties are beginning to dissolve and people are casting around for a way to describe what it is they want for the new world that is coming into being. Um, I wanted to say one thing and then we'll, I, I'd be happy to take some questions else about, about Virginia's final points about populism, which also came up with Balash. So using my admittedly very partial lens, which is to do sort of intellectual genealogies of neoliberal intellectuals, you can see things that can offer insights to this question. So from the 1920s, I would say, until the 1980s, the main way that neoliberals talked about this problem of protecting capitalism from democracy was forms of controlling the masses. How can you constrain political will and popular will through constitutional structures that serve to lock in certain prerogatives of capitalist freedom and economic freedom and prevent the achievement of other kinds of goals, redistributive just, justice and social justice. So it was a, it was a top down pro problem of, as, um, as Andrew Gamble once memorably put it, Hayek's idea was he could persuade other elites like himself, but for the masses, disenfranchisement was the only real option. So it was a problem of elite persuasion and then um, constitutional constraint. In the 1980s and 90s, especially with the disenchantment around the European Union, which had been seen as a potentially uh, positive development by many neoliberal intellectuals, into the 90s, they started to have their serious doubts. They felt like Jacques Delors was doing a, something uh, redistributive with it, creating this version of social Europe. And there was, within intellectual discussions among neoliberals, a real return to the nation and a belief that if you want to protect capitalism, scaling up is actually a mistake. It's actually a misstep to think that you can scale up and lock in capitalist freedoms. You actually need to secure this at the level of the nation. And some neoliberal uh, Montpellier Society members were the most active advocates of secession from the European Union in the 1990s and, of course, helped lead through things like the Bruges Group, the uh, European Constitutional Group, and um, later, of course, the Leave campaign itself. The, um, they laid some of the, the intellectual foundations for anti-EU sentiment, pro-nationalism, as a properly neoliberal position. The same thing, of course, has happened within Brazil. You mentioned Brazil. Um, there's been a close collaboration between people at the Mises Institute in Berlin and Brazil and the Bolsonaro government report, reportedly the, the placement of Paulo Guedes into government as a partner of Bolsonaro happened through the, um, the help of someone named Winston Ling, who is a libertarian think tanker in Brazil. And there, there the theorizing is it goes exactly like this. The supranational has is no longer a rescue for capitalism. It's actually a dangerous space it will lead to um, the disenfranchisement of capitalists. So you need to 
return to the nation, secede perhaps even to smaller entities. And that is the, the foundation upon which um, economic freedom can be saved in an era in which communism has gone from being red to being green in, in, and progressive causes have supposedly colonized the space of the international. So there's all kinds of paranoia and, and misunderstanding and misapprehension, but one can kind of um, periodize a movement of neoliberal thought um, from a faith in the international to a real suspicion of the international and a renewal of the faith in the space of the nation and a shared ethnicity as the necessary foundation for capitalist good health. Okay, I think I'll leave it at that so we, so we can at least take some questions. Thank you very much. So um, we have a few uh, questions, actually. Uh, some of you already wrote them down, but I wanted to ask Kevin Wingfield if uh, you could actually ask the question yourself and also Tamar, while I think Mario actually doesn't have a good audio right now. So I will first call uh, Sabine Dreher and then uh, uh, Kevin, uh, Mario, Tamar, and Alex. Sabine, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hey. Thank you for the excellent presentations, uh, Sabine from Toronto, Canada. Um, my question is whether the, uh, I think you're too pessimistic in terms of a new alignment. I think they found one with the Green New Deal. Um, in, and uh, with Bill Gates publishing on climate crisis. And I have just this week read an article by the Alberta Conservatives uh, criticizing this new global uh, effort at coordinating a response to the climate crisis. And I think this is much further ahead than I was uh, thinking. So um, from what I see is that uh, the, the, the internationally oriented neoliberal bunch has, or capitalist bunch has managed again to uh, take over some progressive element with the Green New Deal thinking and is now trying to orchestrate and using the pandemic to orchestrate a global response to this. So I'm asking from a more from an activist perspective because I'm, as far as I understand it, I'm a part of this now uh, as a Canadian climate activist and I'm a bit worried where I position myself. So it's an activist question. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Um, Kevin, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Very bad audio. Okay. Um, uh, uh, no? no? No, I think we'll just we'll read it from the chat. Yeah, yeah. We'll, read it. we'll read it from me. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Nice to see you. Okay, so Kevin's question is this, let me find it. Okay, so he found your book quite enli very enlightening, especially the uh, state in case in the economy against the threats posed by democracy. And he found himself thinking of Perry Anderson's and others recent writings on the EU in New Left Review and London Review of Books. And uh, um, Harry Anderson's assertion that neoliberalism is structurally embedded in the EU, in particular through the ultimate authority of the European Court of Justice. This reminds us of the arguments of imperialism and Lenin's assertion that it was not to be thought of as a mere policy, but structured in capitalism as uh, its highest form with important political consequences. Uh, does Queen and the rest of the panel uh, find these thoughts plausible? And what is the political upshot of the dominance and encasement of neoliberalism today? Okay, this is quite a, um, an articulated uh, question. So I think that uh, Lea is translating it for Virginia. We'll just collect a few questions uh, and, and and then uh, moving to Mario's question, which I think I need to read because he had some issues with his uh, mic. So in traditional narratives, the liberal global economic order is made to be the product of the fear of protectionism and trade discrimination, uh, features of the interwar years that are said to have triggered the World War II that could have destroyed capitalism. Uh, you suggest, Quinn, that it was originally a fear of democracy that ordered liberals brought to bear in the construction of the post-war global order. 
This is question for both you and Balash. Uh, what was the distinctive event or series of events that really made the neoliberal, uh, neoliberals so scared about democracy? Like, for example, you mentioned uh, Red Vienna and the Great Depression, but can you elaborate on which concrete mass demands for democracy um, connected to those historical events can be cast as the threat to capitalist capitalism, which made all the liberals uh, so fearful of democracy. Uh, then there is Tamar. Tamar, I don't know if you're here and you can ask the question yourself. Will you appear or not? Um, yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Uh, so thank you very much for the presentations. And my question is, uh, so I haven't read the book yet, so I have a very um, abstract um, perception of it but what I heard from the presentation so Quinn actually argues that neoliberalism historically was to some extent a reaction to nationalism of newly independent states or they were just opposed to nationalists uh, and given this uh, how can we now imagine neoliberalism uh, merged with nationalism as it can be observed from the Hungarian perspective as noted by Balash um, so for me, these two are itself contradictory with each other and how it can be um, uh, realized in reality that, for example, in Hungary, the neo neoliberalism, ha neoliberalism has not faded yet, but it's actually coexisting with nationalism. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. And um, I think uh, the last question um, we're taking now is Alex's question, Alex. Okay, thanks very much. All I, I want to, I want to be concise, famous last word. Um, I think Balash said something very important when he said, said uh, or asked, how do we situate neoliberalism within the larger history? of liberalism in the 20th and 21st centuries because there's another version of liberalism which doesn't see democracy as necessarily a threat which in fact develops largely as an adaptation to the development of mass politics initially particularly in britain in the at the end of the 19th century with gladstone then with the 1905 liber liberal government which seeks to, um, if you like, colonize a working class electorate by pursuing moderately reformist and interventionist policy. The two most important products of this, this aspect of liberalism are uh, Roosevelt and Keynes. Um, and therefore, I think that, I mean, this isn't a criticism of Quinn's book, which is Im immensely educative, but if we want more broadly to, to contextualize neoliberalism, we need to look at these, the, um, you know, these two different paths that are taken by liberalism, confronted by the, I would say, the transformations in capitalism of the, of the, the, the 20th century. And of course, we know it's the failure of the kind of policy version of the, the left liberalism of someone like Keynes, which gives, which allows the neoliberals to get into the big time. I mean, one interesting question is clearly neoliberalism is in crisis, although it keeps its kind of skeletal grip on the levers of, of policy, policy making. Is it, is it possible that we could have a, a revival of you know, some genuine form of, of left liberalism, or is is it a busted plush? Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, there was a kind of misunderstanding with Virginia, so she will need to leave earlier. So if you don't mind, um, I would like to ask her if she wants to get back to any of the questions. Uh, Leah, uh, Virginia, what do you think? I don't know, is Virginia there? Oui, yeah. euh, je vais demander des excuses à tout le monde, mais j'avais prévu trois heures d'intervalle pour notre rencontre. <laughs>
et j'ai un autre, une autre rencontre qui doit commencer dans 10 minutes. Sorry everyone, I thought it was three hours, but there is another meeting that starts in 10 minutes that Virginia needs to go to. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you Virginia, merci beaucoup. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Okay, shall I respond? Yes, please. Okay. So sort of I'll take the I'll take the questions in order. First one, so this is, I think, one of the virtues of using a pretty narrow um, definition of neoliberalism that, in my case anyway, focuses quite discreetly on, a, on a, an intellectual tradition that has been developed now for almost a century um, and a pretty closed group of actors from the people who I started the talk with up to um, a group of people mostly associated with this sort of intellectual debate society called the Mulpelleran Society, which has been the site of a lot of very vigorous and, and very interesting and productive debates over how one can protect capitalism in its the face of its transforming challenges from decade to decade. Within this group, there are nobody, there are not, there's not a single person who advocates anything close to anything like the Green New Deal or anything close to the, the forms of intervention into consumer behavior, national um, sovereignty, corporate prerogative, that all of the measures around climate mitigation are now being uh, discussed in the spirit of. So the, the neoliberal position, in my sense, has been solidly opposed to environmentalism, the green movement, or any kinds of acceptance of even the reality of anthropogenic climate change for the last 30 or 40 years. In that sense, I find it difficult from my own understanding to describe those attempts to respond to climate change at all as neoliberal. It doesn't scan for me. I think there are forms of um, trying to make climate change response as amenable as possible to corporate prerogatives that could begin to be described as neoliberal, but for the most part, the, the right-wing neoliberal nexus that has formed in the last 30 years, partially reflecting um, a return to nationalism and ethnocentrism, as I mentioned, has really been defined in opposition to an ever more globally organized climate movement. So in that sense, my, my advice to someone who's a climate activist is keep being a climate activist and be very skeptical of these kind of claims that proliferate through the right-wing media ecosystems, which suggests that somehow attempts to slow down the rapid rate of global heating is a neoliberal plot. I find that to be the, re the reverse is in fact true. The attempt to accelerate global heating is a neoliberal plot that has been very successful for the last several hundred years. What, so in other words, be skeptical about attempts to make Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum somehow the puppet masters for all of the world's problems is simply not the case. That far exaggerates their importance and their power. Um, be skeptical of people who argue that the status quo of, car of carbonization and the economy is the only way that freedom can be defended. I think that the it's clear that the long-term survival of the human race relies on these kind of international and eventually global responses to climate change. So I simply see this as, as an incredibly damaging and problematic um, challenge right now that, that we are all facing, anyone on the left, and I think anyone who's on the left and doesn't believe in the need to respond to climate change is um, not on the left. <laughs> um, we need to be extremely exacting about um, defending ourselves against these, these kind of charges um, while still making sure that whatever response to climate change comes about is one that also responds to existing social and economic inequalities. So that's my advice for Sabina. If you're a climate activist, great. Keep on doing it. Don't listen to the Alberta conservatives. <laughs> that's always a good policy. Um, the ECJ question um, from Kevin Wingfield. So that's a great question. I have a chapter in my book about the neoliberal opinion of European economic integration. And the thing that they liked the best was the European Court of Justice. Um, 
the person who animates that chapter is someone named Ernst Joachim Messmaker, who worked at the European Commission, uh, helping to develop the kind of put the teeth, let's say, uh, in the Director General for Competition Policy. And he was amazed because he thought that the European Court of Justice had achieved something that the League of Nations never had. And in fact, the United Nations had never had, which is it had um, produced a legitimate mechanism by which national sovereignty could be overruled for the sake of the free movement of capital and, um, capital and goods. So the fact that state-owned enterprises could be you know, made illegal through the European Court of Justice, that, um, that the protection of domestic products was made illegal through the European Court of Justice was to the neoliberals, the great innovation of the EU. I think that Perry Anderson would agree. Um, I mean, I, we've corresponded about the book and he, he, he and in, 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 in some ways, my interpretation of the EU was inspired by his early writings about the relationship between Hayekian Federation and European economic integration. Where I think that I would depart from his interpretation is to see um, the EU as somehow now essentially and irrevocably hardwired with neoliberal principles in a way that's totally unadaptable. That I don't, I wouldn't go that far only because I think as a historian, one sees so many transformations in institutions that it's never um, the safe position to say that something can never change. And also I sort of counterpose this implicitly through following these genealogies of neoliberal Euroskeptics to show that people who have been against Europe haven't all just been sort of brave sort of asterisk type figures, which is I think sometimes how someone like Wolfgang Strake tends to characterize them, but have often in fact been people who advocate an even more accelerated form of capitalism rather than somehow a cushioned uh, form of renewed embedded liberalism. Third question was about, um, was about the Second World War and when neoliberals started to worry about democracy. So also I think a good question. This is the, it's in a way it can be answered very simply, which is that neoliberals of the Austrian school anyway, believed like their compatriot Schumpeter that the practice of democracy would over time lead to socialism. So Hayek and Mises saw socialism as the inevitable conclusion of unconstrained democracy. It was the end point of mass politics. Therefore, democracy always needed to be constrained, directed, managed in some way to prevent that outcome. So when they looked at, when Hayek looked at, this is the essence of the road to serfdom, when he looked at the Soviet Union and National Socialist Germany, he saw them both actually as problems in essence of democracy. There were problems where the people were allowed to demand of the state what they wanted and the state then was forced to give it to them. The Soviet Union did it through something they called communism. The National Socialist did it through, you know, plunder and, exp and expropriation of, of populations internally and externally. But these were both in effect um, pathologies of democracy. So in that sense, when neoliberals looked at the, the ashes of Europe after the Second World War, they, in, in a very profound way, thought that it had been brought to its knees by democracy, which is very strange when you think about it. But um, it was for this reason that they needed to restore a path that would prevent the knocking of the train of, um, of liberalism off its rails, either to the left or to the right. And this, I think, is, isn't a bad way to segue to Alex's question. So you say that, I mean, of course I agree with you. There are many genealogies and all of them are necessary to make sense of anything really. The, the genealogy of new liberalism in the UK is probably in world historical terms, more important than the history of the post Habsburg moment. The question though, of how different the conclusions were of both groups, I think is something I might push back on slightly. I think especially I had the feeling, at least after reading Jeff Mann's wonderful book about Keynes, that there wasn't as much daylight between Hayek and a Keynes as even I had thought previously. And that in fact, Keynes was deeply skeptical and, and suspicious of the unconstrained practice of mass democracy. And that in fact, he was proposing an institutional fix that involved you know, a more interventionist state and active you know, deficit spending and so on. 
but that this wasn't um, this wasn't a polar opposite to Hayek in the same way one would get the impression with the title of many books, Hayek versus Keynes, the rap battle sponsored by the Austrian George Mason University um, that featured Hayek and Keynes rapping with each other as if these two were mortal sort of enemies and opposites. I don't think that's accurate. I think that Keynes's conclusion about how to constrain democracy and, and channel it involved more concessions to the working class, more concessions to the organized um, the forces of organized labor and didn't uh, didn't um, use the the militancy, of course, and the, the the appeal to the gun that Mises did, of course. But I think they were operating from a, in some ways a similar problematic. And Keynes, besides his you know his dalliance with national uh, self sufficiency in the 30s, notwithstanding by the end of the Second World War also had foremost in his mind how to restore the world economic unity, right? What kind of institutions were necessary, in fact, to encase a global economy interested in basically the same matters that the um, Austrian neoliberals were. <clears throat> what becomes of Keynes's thought after Keynes's death, of course, is a fraught question and a huge discussion. Uh, people talk about quote unquote bastard Keynesianism People talk about actual existing Keynesianism. One can't conflate Keynes himself and his own writings with the practices of global capitalist management from 1945 to the end of the 1970s. So we need to be a lot more. We need to be a lot more precise there. But I think that you know, Alex asked the important question at the end about what prospects there are for left liberalism of any um, sustainable kind in this present moment. And there I would reiterate something that's been a kind of theme in my responses so far, which is that we need to pay more attention to, I think, what I would call the politics of scale. I think the space within which um, institutions are being proposed for and fixes are being proposed for, whether, whether they are to protect capitalism or to um, help um, accelerate the movement towards something like socialism, the question of where that happens is essential. Right now, I think that it's the most important insight about the direction of neoliberal thought is there a movement away from the global and the supranational towards the national. There's a, dubi there's a dubiousness about multilateralism that simply was not there even five years ago. Um, and that is indeed a kind of a new consensus. And the challenge is actually it cycles us right back to Sabina's point from the first question, which is, how can we um, conceive of a left liberalism that is responsive to the most pressing matters of our planetary moment that operates also at the planetary scale without this appearing as a kind of elite conspiracy being concocted at Davos and then downloaded onto the peoples of the world, right? How can we do left liberal globalism without looking like the kind of uh, hand servants of Gates and company? And that is not an easy question. It's much easier to be in resistance and to call for secession than it is to talk about how to build up layers of, of um, social justice through the supranational stratum, which are inhabited by and for the most part owned by parties and capitalist um, organizations that have no interest in the actual questions of redistribution and social justice that we do. So I think that's the, that's the challenge is how to scale up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll ask Balash to intervene, if that's okay, Balash. Yeah, thanks a lot. I will try to run through some of the questions. I mean, one about uh, EU and neoliberal embeddedness or, or, or roots. I, I think that that's obviously a, a, an important point and it's of course needs a lot of fine tuning. But I mean, just if I can quote uh, or refer to a more or less personal uh, uh, experience. I mean, like the the whole story about the EU uh, dealing with CU, yes, our, our university, and how they were trying to find some ways to kind of condemn uh, the government of Hungary, basically kicking out the university from Hungary. And it was very telling that in the end, the ruling was actually citing the WTO uh, 
uh, uh, regulations that Hungarian government was violating. So actually, it was very hard for the EU to find normative basis. Even academic freedom sounds nice, but they couldn't really legitimize that that's a problem because everybody can interpret it very differently. And then in the end, they were kind of arguing from the perspective or part of the judgment. And definitely the European Commission's first reaction was completely about free circulation of uh, capital. Yeah, So they translated education immediately into uh, circulation of capital, which was, I think, quite striking. I mean, I understood the logic of it, but it was very telling. And and uh, I think that also, of course, gives a certain kind of way for uh, populists to kind of play out liberalism against democracy. Yes, and I mean, of course, it also, uh, while neoliberals try to be liberals without democracy, some of these populists try to be or claim to be Democrats without liberalism. And I think this is somehow a kind of interesting mirror uh, a situation which reinforces somehow each other, I think. So th this might be one of the interesting dialectics between populism and neoliberalism. Uh, now, the uh, other the question about uh, formative experiences of uh, democracy being problematic for, for this generation, like uh, Hayek and, um, and uh, Mises and the others, I think uh, I would even go before the First World War and I mean, just think about, and, and maybe that will be a little bit surprising that the, when we think about democracy, we tend to somehow identify it with the left. Yes, I mean, like we somehow hope that somehow democracy and the left is going together in some ways. But I mean, think about the fact that in Vienna, the big breakthrough of mass democracy was Karl Lueger, yes, the anti-Semitic mayor of Vienna, another beautiful target of uh, Karl Scholzke's uh, uh, other uh, very famous essay. Uh, who was actually coming with a very strong democratic legitimization with the ethno-populist uh, narrative and was actually blocked by the emperor, you know, the last bastion of pre-modern uh, uh, system to, to become the mayor. And like for a long time, the emperor simply didn't nominate him as a mayor, even though he won the election. And in the end, uh, they let him go. And then he, as you probably know, he created a very specific political culture, like uh, young Adolf Schickel Gruber was also learning some, some things when he was visiting uh, Vienna, but otherwise a very complex uh, social politics, uh, you know, lots of things. Yeah. So I mean, like when, when we are thinking about this kind of traumatic breakthrough of of democracy, then it's not just about social democrats uh, and trade unions. It's also about uh, ethnopopulism uh, of the turn of the century. But then, of course, in the 1920s, there is another round of this, uh, which which I think Quinn was already mentioning. Now, as for the question of Keynes and, and uh, alternatives of liberalism, I, I would also uh, say that, that the interference is very interesting and very complex. I mean, don't forget that uh, they almost invited Keynes to the Walter Lippmann uh, uh, colloquium. So, I mean, actually, the founding meeting of, uh, of the neoliberals was almost in the presence of Keynes, and and basically Keynes was at that point point considered to be more or less an ally, uh, and not an enemy. I mean, it comes basically after the Second World War when he's other as the kind of radical other of Hayek, but like at this point not. And also, if you look at the the protocols of this uh, meeting, which is now very widely available, I mean, they are also claiming that they are the left liberals. Actually, like when, when the discussion is about how to call themselves neoliberal is one of the suggestions, but the other suggestion is left liberal. Yes, and, and it's not by chance, yes, because they are actually their enemy at that point is very much Manchesterian uh, uh, 19th century. They are kind of uh, very much arguing against laissez-faire. I mean, that's their main enemy is not Keynes. Their main enemy is, is the passé 19th century uh, laissez-faire liberalism. And then uh, the last question about, uh, um, uh, I think, uh, populism and, and nationalism and uh, neoliberalism and how this comes together. I mean, I, I, I think maybe just to um, a little bit hybridize further Quinn's uh, uh, analytical categories, I, I, I think there is a kind of encased neoliberalism or nested neoliberalism now. Uh, in many countries. And I mean, like Hungary is one example, but think also about Japan and other cases. Yes. So I mean, a kind of attempt to to put, uh, and I think what, what Quinn said about this kind of uh, scaling back to the nation state as a protecting uh, capitalism it might be part of the story, but it might also connect to to other things. Like, I mean, how, how for example, it refer, uh, relates to uh, migration 
and how migration became a, a kind of uh, key issue for political mobilization and stuff like that. And uh, what uh, for me is important in this respect, and I, I wouldn't name the person, but at one of the conferences, a very prominent German um, left liberal intellectual uh, was arguing like uh, it was about European crisis and all that. And he was telling us that, you know, guys, I mean, like, sorry, but European Union is is, is hopeless. It doesn't really, you know, command any kind of legitimacy. Let's go back to the na nation state, you know. And I was thinking that, okay, it's very nice. I mean, like, if you are a German, uh, of course, if you are a German, you have to think twice what, what you say about the nation state. But okay, if you are a happy citizen of the Bundesrepublik, you can claim that that uh, the nation state is a functional framework where probably citizens uh, believe more in the legitimacy of decisions than in the European bureaucracy. But what should I tell coming from Hungary? I mean, going back, scaling back to the nation state basically is actually means that there is no way we can. So even the weakest European Union is the protection that my father, who is 85 and goes to the demonstration, will not be killed. Yes, I mean, now, of course, there are limited demonstrations, but even so, uh, I mean, like even the even the weakest and the most bureaucratic and most stupid European Union provided some sort of protection for people who are contesting this kind of strange combination of neoliberal economics and uh, and uh, repressive uh, and ethnopopulist politics and repressive uh, uh, kind of social uh, policies. So, I mean, like in this respect, I, I don't think now deciding that scaling back everything to the nation state because it seems to be more tangible and more controllable for the citizens is is actually a solution i mean it might ac actually lead us to to extremely problematic direction uh, even though there might be winners in this but uh, there will be losers as well so so i think that's that's the last uh, thing i wanted to say and once again thanks for for uh, co collecting all all these people and i hope that this this is a, a kind of tradition that you keep up even in these crazy times to, to bring people together and create interference between very different uh, thinking, ways of thinking. Well, yes, I think, uh, thank you so much. I think this is one of the kind of upsides of the current situation that uh, it gives us the opportunity to um, uh, create dialogues uh, between people in different parts of the world. So I don't think we'll go back to, uh, the kind of pre-Zoom uh, world after, if there is an after to this pandemic. I just feel like I need to represent Virginia because Virginia isn't here anymore. And so I just wanted to make a provocation before we leave. And if you'd like to get back to me, I'd be happy. So I thought that the kind of main point of uh, her argument was like, is it really, um, good to look at democracy as the kind of uh, principle through which like social demands can be expressed right which which seems like your position well instead uh, what she was trying to do was like to center the argument again, uh, around the class struggle and and so um so what i understood is that she believes that uh, centering the argument around the class struggle allows us to look at the kind of different fractions and also positions of capitalists uh for example more globalist positions uh, you, you were talking about a kind of retreat from this but probably the chinese uh capitalist class uh has a more globalist attitude right now so if if we look at the global level uh maybe centering around the class struggle would allow us to look at the kind of unity in the difference of these different fractions of capital. And at the same time, I think it would also push us to center the debate about alternatives uh, beyond this kind of false dichotomy between the nation state and the global level, looking, uh, which I think seems to be a kind of recurrent topic, looking at the kind of alternative in the end between capitalism and socialism. Right. So I, th I thought this was the kind of uh, um, key point that she was making. And uh, I thought I, I needed to represent that uh, since she's not here. I don't know if you want to uh, add anything. Otherwise, I really thank you for this amazing uh, debate. Uh, let me know. Yeah. yeah I mean, I just I guess in a line or two. I think that the way you've represented that argument is a good one because I think there are ways in which just paring this down to a question of capitalism versus democracy 
sort of takes the language of neoliberals on its own terms in certain ways. And that I think to understand the complexity of the global challenge we're facing, you need to begin to at least start taking apart the difference between, let's say, consensus around trade versus consensus around things like financial activity versus labor policies. And these things all map onto the specific interests of capitalist fractions, um, different sectors of production, different sectors of, of, um, of political economy. So certainly breaking it down beyond the kind of the, the titanic opposition between democracy and capitalism is important, especially when I, I posted in the chat, I have a recent paper on the, um, the embrace of things like direct democracy and referenda by neoliberals themselves, right? My, and I set it up by sort of saying, this is the common opposition. Well, what happens when neoliberals start calling for referenda? Can we still call them anti-democrats? How do we have, have to finesse our own arguments when we are confronted with these apparent contradictions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Hank Overbeck complains, Queen, that you write more than ordinary people can keep up with. So but we'll try, right, as humanly possible to keep up with all your uh, arguments and articles. So thank you. Uh, I think it was really great. Thanks also to, um, well, George for his translation and Leah, who also helped with the translation and uh, he's here now. And uh, well, we'll see. We'll see everyone if uh, you come in two weeks with the discussion of worth making after Empire. Thank you and uh, goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, Quinn. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you.